scenic Philadelphia, where on one day a year, the Scullers on the Schuylkill take a backseat to the Bikers on the Wall. It's for the best in the world. It's for the finest in the country. On this day, Father's Day, Philadelphia hosts almost 100 top athletes. Men preparing to give their all in the richest one day pro cycling challenge in the world. It's the 1990 Core States U.S. Pro Cycling Championship. to ride a bike and a wonderful day to watch it here in Philadelphia along the Schuylkill. Beautiful, 78 degrees, 64% humidity, and a sunny day. Hello there, everybody. This is Al Meltzer, along with Dave Chauner, who started this thing six years ago. Something, huh? It's great, Al. We've got the biggest crowd assembled here that we've ever had at the start. It's going to be a great day. We've got a really good field of riders. It should turn out to be a, a real exciting race. And the number one analyst in the world, Phil Liggett. Phil. Hi, Al. Well, you know, the big problem for the European riders, especially today, is the high humidity value. And I think that will make them struggle. This will be a tough race. And it all started at 9 o'clock this morning. Riders ready! We are underway! And what a colourful start it was. All 92 riders, in first of all, setting out for two and a half laps of the Ben Franklin Parkway before shooting off along the banks of the Schuylkill River on the first of ten. 14.8 mile laps. It was action from the gun as well. Predic predictably, it was 7-Eleven who early in the race, as they always do with Roy Nickman here, and as he did in 1987, off on the attack. And it was a really uh, aggressive start to the race this year. Nobody knows that better than Jim Okowitz, team manager of 7-Eleven. Our strategy today is to, is to ride more on the offense than the defense, so... Um, you know, we want to keep things together at the early part of the race and then start making some attacks later on. And so after only 10 miles, a break of five riders concern early on for the cause light team as Alexi Grable talks to his manager. The field behind always under pressure, Al, and it's looking like a real good race today. We have completed three laps, and that's the first lap in 31.54, which means an average speed of 26.2. Gentlemen, that's fast. Two of the 92 have abandoned. Experience counts a lot here in the court states. If you've been along the route, you know what's happening. There it is, 7-Eleven, which, of course, has to be the favorite. Toshiba, the European team, which is back again this year, and Coors Light, which took it all last year. So there you have it. We'll be back with the start of the race after this. The 1990 Coors States U.S. Pro Championship is brought to you by Coors States, the financial services company. The course consists of a 14.8 mile circuit through the streets of Philadelphia. Ten times these riders will face a variety of twists and turns designed to test the best of them. Their journey begins and ends on picturesque Benjamin Franklin Parkway, onto Kelly Drive, a smooth stretch along the scenic Schuylkill River. Then on to Maniunk, where Main Street takes them to an area known simply as the Wall. This is the infamous Maniunk Wall. It climbs 250 vertical feet in less than a half mile. That's as high as a 28-story building. The competitors will climb the wall 10 times. It's the naked or break it point of the bike race. The fall from the wall is steep as riders head back to Kelly Drive and route to the country's largest park, Fairmount, where the tranquility of Strawberry Meadows is quickly interrupted by the short, sharp climb of Lemon Hill. Lemon Hill. It's not as tough as the Maniunk Wall but this short, rhythm-breaking climb comes only three miles from the finish line on the Benjamin Franklin Parkway. It's here, particularly on the last lap, where the strong riders will try to get rid of the weak ones. Now the money. And this is it. This is the biggest money in the United States in racing today. 25,000 down to six. 40 spots available and $110,000 total. So they're not only racing for the team, they're racing there's a pretty good bread here. At the wall, we have the Pepsi Challenge. What's that about, David? Well, the Pepsi Wall Challenge also carries another $5,000 in prize money, and there's team prizes as well. So 
uh, that total of 110 uh, breaks out into a lot of different categories. There you see the purse breakdown for the Pepsi Wall Challenge. First place is worth $2,500 all the way down to $350 for fifth. And the guys work pretty hard for that, I would say, Phil. Oh, this is the whole center's point of this race. It's made it so famous throughout the world. Everybody talks about the wall all over Europe these days. And they always believe it's a real sweat box, you know, because it's never, ever raining in Philadelphia. We're into year six now, and it's rain it's uh, lovely and sunny. And let's go straight to the leaders. Al, here they are, two riders in the lead. And we've got Steve Speaks, the second man here, and Alan McCormack from Ireland, of course, but he's on the Cause Light team. And this is a very good move very early on, David, by Cause Light. There, there's no question. It's interesting that uh, Alan McCormack, who's there on the right side, uh, riding for Coors Light. He was the first winner of the King of the Wall competition back in 1985. He dropped out of the race after that, but he's been known in the past as an early starter. He'd get out and, and try and break away early in the race, but would often fade towards the end. And uh, this looks like the old Alan McCormick, not the one that has said in recent years that he wants to conserve his energy a little bit. Uh, Steve Speaks is right there, number 84, riding as the sole crest rider in the event, is well prepared for this race. He's been training six hours a day. He was the best American finisher in the Tour de Trump, and he's a, a definitely a wild card that we have to watch out for. But, Phil, I don't know about you. I think uh, it's, Steve is going to have to be in really good shape to hold this lead for, for the entire race. There's obviously a plan here. Steve has come into this race, in effect, as a professional rider yet again because he was a pro, and then he was an amateur for the Tour de Trump. He's now switched his license back to pro. It's something you can't do too often, Al. He's done it a couple of times now and I don't think he will be allowed to do that again. But anyway, in this race, he's proving that he has good form, Dave, because he's been training hard down in Colorado. He comes from Longmount in uh, Boulder County in Colorado, and he's been doing six-hour hilly training rides down there in the Rockies. He believes he can, he's fit enough to hold this race off for six hours, and let's, uh, let's point out the fact he is now on a record-breaking experience here at the moment, better than Tom Schuller's winning ride three years ago. But not likely. Neither of these will be one, two at the end of this six-hour grueling race because there's a lot more to racing than just who's in front and who's second, third, and strung out like you'd find in ordinarily any race. The strategy is different in each year. They follow the strategy here. you got a couple of rabbits that go up front, and then the big guys take over near the end. It has become a strategy in this race for a rabbit to take an early lead, but the early leader doesn't really intend to win. It's all part of the complex strategy of bicycle racing. Wallace has got to start tiring, as Mike Engelman did last year. As we said earlier, Wallace is not considered a real long-distance road rider, but you never know. If the lead builds up to 7, 8, 9, 10 minutes, the further he goes, even if he gets tired and starts losing ground, the faster the field has to go, and that's definitely going to play a factor uh, in the race. And there's a lead change. John Baldy of Switzerland is overtaking early race leader Sean Wallace. Wallace of the Wheaty Schwinn team has led the race for five laps, not unlike teammate Mike Engelman, who led for six last year. But Baldy's by without even looking back. He looks determined to take over. In last year's course stage championship, Sean Wallace broke away early, mainly to make a name for himself, and the early effort completely burned him out. I'm totally fried. It's uh, that's the longest I've ridden in quite a while. I've been I haven't done a road race for two months, and uh, uh, I worked hard. And geez, I'm I'm fried. I'm tired. This is the first real move I would suggest of the Core States Championship today, and Ron Keeple is in on it. Keeple definitely was the instigator in that one. We've got uh, the top teams represented. That's a uh, Coors Light is in there. There's Mike Engelman of the Weedy Schwinn team. Last uh, year's race turned out to be a textbook example of perfect cycling strategy. As expected, all the top squads protected their stars by sending out the team lieutenants on this four-man breakaway. But for Team 711, there was the extra burden of having to lead the breakaway because the team is America's cycling powerhouse. And 7-Eleven quickly discovered that a powerhouse has few friends indeed. It's 320, and they're not taking. There's nothing real organized. They're all at the front, but they're not doing anything. They're not working? No. Euro cars are making a couple of cats trying to get Gaggioli up, but they're not doing anything. But right now, Coors Light is doing nothing. Coors Light, of course, was happy to sit by and let 7-Eleven do all of the work at the front. Um, Orovitz, who's sitting back on the back and fourth spot, did not take his turn with the group. When it came back for the last man to slide in, Orovitz let a gap open. With the finish near, 7-Eleven's Ron Kiefel had done most of the work, while Coors Light's Greg Orovitz was playing a great tactical game. What's going on out there? 
Well, it looks like we've got Greg Orvitz covering the break, the move. And he made the break with the other guys so that our team would not be obligated to chase. He's out there working for Greg Lamond and Lexi Graywall, covering the move for them. So if just in case that move stays away, he could win the race. But otherwise, they'll be fresh if it comes down to a sprint or another break. But now the sprint has started. And there's no surprise that Orvitz, less of a star than 7-Eleven's Ron Keeple, won last year's championship. He had sat in the back of the breakaway, benefiting from the draft, while Keeple was obligated, as the 7-Eleven rider, to leave. In the end, it was Keeple who was exhausted, and Arovitz, the new U.S. pro champion. And Arovitz, by the way, is not here because he has a serious knee injury and cannot defend his title, so the onus is falling here on Alan McCormack in the lead, and Steve Speaks tucked in nicely behind him. So, Cause Light are trying to dominate. They, they're playing the tactics. They've put the carrot out up front, and they're expecting the rest of the field to chase them down. And I'm not so sure, Dave, where they might, they might be giving them a lot of work to do back in the bunch. Well, I think there's a few riders that will always try to bridge the gap. There's Oliver Starr, number 46 from the Spago team. Uh, it's very difficult for one man alone like this to try and bridge the gap, particularly a four-minute gap from the field up to the two leaders. But he's obviously putting some effort into it, and uh, we'll see if he'll be able to make it. There's still a long way to go, so you stay tuned. One, two, three o'clock, four o'clock, rock. Five, six, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, rock. Nine, ten, the eleven, LA o'clock, twelve o'clock, rock. Why not for breakfast? Oh, yeah. On weekdays till 10 a.m. Two eggs, two strips of bacon, toast, and hash browns. Ooh, only $1.99. Nightly dinner special, seven days a week. Serve till midnight. Yes. If you're into exciting atmosphere, full bar, good food, and roller skating service, join us at the last American Diner. We're back, and there's a look at the leaders, and we're just about uh, halfway through lap six. Ten laps to go, 156 miles, 14.8 on the course. A couple of trips first around uh, the parkway, and then, of course, the big finish, which will come our way. I don't know whether it's going to be record time or not. What do you think? It looks like uh, they're still on a very fast pace. The leaders now are 3.30 ahead. That, that gap has shrunk from seven minutes to three minutes and 30 seconds. Three and a half minutes uh, uh, has been picked up just on the last lap and a half. So that really indicates that the uh, uh, pack has really started to zero in on these guys. And it looks to me, Phil, like they're going a lot slower than they were uh, this time last lap. Yeah, you're right. In fact, the 7-Eleven boys are, have uh, uh, caused pain here. They've reduced it to 3 minutes 30, but they paid a price as well, Dave, because on the wall, uh, Tommy Matouche and uh, Craven have gone from the 7-Eleven team. They've been dropped by the pack. So, too, has Sean Wallace out. We see them for one day. But these are our athletes who race not only in the United States, but all over the world. It is a unique life. It's, it's different, guys, isn't it? I mean, you have one-day races, you have the tour races, you have... Uh, races up the Alps, races up the wall. Uh, how do you adjust to all of this? Uh, how do they do that with the travel schedule and everything they got there? Well, it's pretty rough on them, and uh, I think they, the riders, of course, love the lifestyle, or they wouldn't be doing it. Uh, they also get paid well for it, I might add, the top ones anyway. And uh, it is uh, kind of a romantic life to lead, I think, uh, for a few years, and a great way to, to, nowadays anyway, make some money for these riders. So let's take a look at the riders uh, on the road in the Tour de Trump. typical day begins just like most of us, with breakfast. A healthy load-up of those 12 essential vitamins, plus a few added tricks of their own. Yeah, yeah get that slop. Then it's on to a team meeting where the day's cycling strategy is planned. You know, you pull out here and you pass. Right here. Yeah. I think Roberto should freelance the sprint the yeah. whole way. Just follow wheels. You know, you can go wherever you feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. Look for the best wheels and follow the train. And what will happen is you'll have the bigger teams like Panasonic and 7-Eleven and PDM winding it up. Swear, if you feel like you can do it, you're probably not going to feel that great today. You're sick. You're not going to be able to ride with Olaf Ludwig when you have a fever. Yeah. you got to... So that don't ride. Just finish the stage. With the mental picture of the task at hand, it's now time to focus on tuning up the body. Okay. It really helps.
when you loosen the other one up. That's, what, I, that's what I'm going to do. I just want to... A team chiropractor makes sure the riders are loose and ready for the demanding ride ahead. Okay. Oh, From arm warmers to leg warmers, each rider gears up in his own way. As the race approaches, it's now time to load up on supplies. Once the race is underway, team manager Lynn Pettyjohn, along with the team mechanic, follows along in the support caravan, offering advice. Go back for Todd. You okay? Can you go back for Todd? Yeah. All right. Comfort. Yeah, I've got farmer's arm warmers. All right. Thanks. Make sure you tell him. It's pretty good, huh? Yeah. And mechanical assistant. Great. Todd, ride that one. You have to pay hard. Switch them over. We'll get it for you what? later. Ninety-eight miles later, a weary Coors Light team must start this ritual all over again, as this day is far from over. Once again, tuning up their bikes and their bodies for a 35-mile circuit race before a well-earned night's rest. And boy, do they deserve that rest uh, at the end of a, a typical day in the life of a pro bike rider. And they go on and on like that. We're back with the chase group now. And this is the situation, and it's still Roy Nickman who has become the workhorse of 7-Eleven, and it does look as though Roy is on a good ride. This is the situation then, as we look back over the day's racing so far. McCormick and Speaks, they broke away from the leading group of five on lap number three, and by lap number six, the lead has gone down from an original seven minutes, five seconds, to what it is right now, three minutes and 30 seconds. And as you can see in the picture, it's the 7-Eleven team who are leading the chase, and in particular, it is Roy Nickman who's trying to tow back into this race riders like Davis Finney so they can use their big sprint finish here on the parkway in a couple of hours time Dave. That's true and it looks like uh, as we had predicted earlier the 7-Eleven team uh, had the burden of chasing down the breakaway. Uh, we saw the Coors Light guys right in there with them. They're in there as well. We haven't really been able to tell whether they're helping or hindering at this point but we did see a little bit earlier the 7-Eleven or the uh, Coors Light guys were chasing as well, and uh, that indicates to me that the signal has been passed back that the corner is fading, and that the Coors Light guys should be in the hunt as well as the 7-Eleven riders. Things are tightening up, and the best is yet to come. We'll be right back. There's Alan McCormick and Steve Speaks definitely showing the effects of a long, hard day in the saddle. Moments ago, Steve Speaks was showing some of those signs of fatigue. You can see reaching back in his jersey, feeling a little bit uncomfortable. Obviously, the heat now a problem for Speaks. Raising his jersey so that perhaps he could cool off a little bit. And that is a, uh, an effect that uh, I think is, is definitely changing the way Steve Speaks is riding. He's uh, showing the signs of heat, heat, discomfort. Uh, it's not long now before they're going to get caught. So we're swinging along the main street, down in Mania, shortly to swing right, and there we go, under the railway bridge, and the main field right behind them now. So the main field probably saw the two leaders make that turn, and it won't be long now, and I think it's going to happen on the wall this time. Remember that Speaks wants just to at least take one more first place on the wall, three more points, and that will uh, that will be the end of the Pepsi Wall Challenge. The latest gap, one minute and seven seconds as we go to the wall. And there again are the two leaders coming up the wall slowly, the uh, field bearing down on them. Again, the uh, the days, the time is numbered for our two leaders, I think, and. Speaks and, and McCormick still valiantly fighting on. I think Speaks would like to pick up that that three points, another three points for the Pepsi Wall Challenge before they get caught. It looks like he might be able to do that. And I think, Phil, what we should watch for this time up the wall is uh, some attacks from the field. This is a very good point uh, for someone in the field or a few riders to try and make a very significant move to...
go up and catch the leaders, bridge the gap, as we say, in cycling in a very short time. Uh, I think we might see that from the main field as we go up the wall this time. Well, this is the fourth from the end. We've just got four climbs of the wall still to come. And look at this now as we go up the wall here. There's the official confirmation of one minute seven. That's at the base of the wall, but these riders now have cracked, and the main field certainly haven't. There's a lot of riders here. Right in the center of our picture behind the rider in the pink jersey is David Farmer. A lot of people feel that he could become the first rider to do the double, as it were, here, to win the freehold race Thursday and uh, then win this one here Sunday as the riders now begin to streak up the climb. And this is Chris Huber. Now look at this. The leaders know this is their last uh, day, last moment of freedom on the wall. And oh, my goodness me, look at the face here now of Steve Speaks. He comes over the top, he gets his three points, but Gaggioli now, and this is the counter-attack we said could come as soon as the Cause Light boys saw their man back in the field, and McCormack is only just in front now, they're attacking again. Roberto Gaggioli, the winner two years ago, is trying to put home an attack that will quickly split this field up, and it's significant, David, that we haven't yet got somebody like David Finney trying to slow down this uh, move at the front. Gaggioli riding very strongly with another 7-Eleven rider right there with him, and it looks like these two teams are still always in the hunt. Gaggioli looking back for teammates to see what kind of damage he's doing, but they are definitely attacking the wall this time, and it's not going to be long before Speaks and McCormick are history. Well, you've got to try, otherwise you never succeed in big-time cycling, and those two riders are certainly not going to go home empty-handed to Philadelphia tonight because they're going to share between them. Uh, $6,000 for their efforts on the wall today. But they're caught, or they will be caught very, very quickly now, and we're going to have new leaders in this race very shortly. This is, though, these were the chasing group. And we try to find where they are, because this is the most difficult part of the course for even our cameramen, who will remember, are out there amongst these bike riders, riding the motorcycles alongside them. A difficult job indeed. On the top of one of our cherry pickers, there's the field, making the turn. And the long descent now off the wall, heading back down uh, towards Kelly Drive. We'll try and pick up the leaders, and then we'll try and work out exactly what the gap is. But I would say now it is no more. In fact, we're getting indications here that they have been picked up over the top of the wall. So they've freewheeled over the top. They have now been swept up. The two leaders are officially caught. So we're looking now, Dave, for a new escape group to get underway. And just look at the way these guys are throwing themselves into the race now. As we said, there were going to be a lot of counterattacks, and that's exactly what's happening. As soon as the two weakened leaders are caught, it's a time to counterattack. And the whole team lineup can change uh, any time now in the bike race. And we're getting down towards the, the closing laps of the race. This is a very important point of the race. This is when the strong guys really make the attacks. And it was Gaggioli from the Coors Light team that really made the move on the wall. Here's a replay of Gaggioli making the attack as they get into the lower slopes of the wall, riding very, very hard. Uh, actually, this is after over the top, but he is now the aggressor in the bike race. Gaggioli looking like he looked in 1988. He was the strongest rider in the race then, and he's showing those kinds of signs here today. Coming now off the wall, again, approaching speed to about uh, 50 miles an hour here. Uh, it looks like the top part of the field, or the main part of the field, is still together. Again, Joey fades back a little bit. That's Michael Zanoli, his teammate from Coors Light, now in the lead. You can always pick out Zanoli because he's one of the biggest riders in the field. That's him on the right-hand side of the screen. Tom Schuler on his left of 7-Eleven. Roberto Gaggioli, a former champion, maybe the first to repeat in the six-year history of the U.S. Pro Cycling Championships conducted here in Philadelphia on Dad's Day every year, the sixth annual. And we'll be right back as we check Roberto, and he's on top. We're looking at them now on the parkway yet again. And this is the main field, still trying to chase down now a group of nine riders that's come together at the front. And it looks to me as though they're about 35 seconds behind them, so they're not allowing them too much leeway. And I think it's got a little embarrassing at the moment for Cause Light. Let's have a look here as they start to go out down the scoople again. Notice that this time 
none of the cause. Well, there's one has taken a food pack, two. Only two of the team has taken on food this time. Alexi Greywalt at the back. Oh, no, they've all done it because this is uh, Roberto Gaggioli at the front alongside Zanoli. We're on lap number nine, so we're heading out towards the final two laps of the circuit. This is obviously the crucial lap, I would say now, David. And I think that probably there are too many big hitters from Cause Light in this group. And there's the attack straight away from Finney. You see, Finney doesn't like all these Cause Light riders being here. He's just going to see just how many of them are still strong. Remember that these two groups merged halfway through the previous lap. And Finney might want to try and rid himself of some of the situation at the end of lap number eight. A good lap time, 33.49. We're going back into the fast mode again because the previous lap just over 34 minutes. Well, Finney has been countered immediately by Zanoli. These two riders, they get on very well off the bike, but you see they're, they're deadly rivals on the bike because they're on rival teams. And Finney's opened the gap. The riders have thrown the little bags away there and got down to the workmanlike business again of catching up with a, a good attack by Finney. That is an international tactic to attack as riders go through the feed zone. It's not always a popular one, though, Dave. That's for sure, but notice Davis Finney did not pick up any food. The other guys were picking up their food. Finney decided, nope, this is my opportunity to attack. He did. He caught the others off guard. Zanoli is with him, but he has broken up that breakaway group. We'll see if Zanoli wants to help. Nope, Zanoli is not swinging off to take pace. He's not going to help uh, Davis Finney at all with this breakaway attempt because he knows his teammates are right back there. But interestingly, Phil, when the main pack came through here, uh, I was watching off the side of the stand here, and I saw that at the lead, working very, very hard, was the entire 7-Eleven team, because they are clearly afraid of having only Finney and Alvis in there uh, with the major Coors Light team. And here they are, the uh, the, the top riders uh, left back in the field of 7-Eleven, led by John Tomac. They are definitely in the chase mode at this point. They don't want Finney and Alvis to be outnumbered by four of Coors Light's best. This is really uh, a tactical battle that's going on right now. Well, the main field know that they must not allow this gap to stretch to a minute because if it does, I think they'll have waved goodbye to the championship today. And let's go back to the leaders because Finney is giving this a lot of power at the moment. And he's got three cause lights, guys. These are impossible odds for Davis Finney. They've got the past winner there, Roberto Gaggioli, right up, tucked into his back wheel. And I think the cause light team have been waiting for the day that Gaggioli delivered the goods. And it looks as though this might be the day. And Finney is beginning to get a little bit upset by the tactics here of cause light. And he's got Gaggioli into the front. And in fact, he's splitting them up here because Farmer now won't come through. He's gone behind 7-Eleven. He's in third slot. And Zanoli took a little look over his shoulder to see what the damage is being done by the pace. And now Finney's doing it as well. And I think they're going to come back together here. It looks like it, Davis. Finney definitely trying to get these riders to go through and go fast. And it looks like Zanoli's taking it up a little bit. It's to their advantage to do it. They've got uh, more riders in this little uh, splinter group, uh, certainly, than, than Davis Finney wants to contend with. And I'm actually surprised that Finney uh, is forcing the pace with two other very good sprinters uh, in this in this uh, particular move. It was really uh, a cheeky move by Davis Finney and the best that we've ever seen. There is Steve Speaks in the pit after leading the race almost uh, for seven laps, picking up the Pepsi Wall Challenge for sure, now out of the bike race. Yeah, Steve really does look tired, but he, he tried to do it the hard way. He had a lot of confidence by going out there this morning, thinking that uh, his six-hour training ride would stand him in good stead today, but he didn't account for the pressure that will come later on in the race, but at least he's carried away $2,500 first prize for the Pepsi Wall Challenge down at Manny Young. We're heading back now towards Manny Young for the penultimate time, lap number nine, down by the Schuylkill. It's on the rider's left shoulder, and right now the water there must look extremely inviting because these riders are losing a lot of body weight today. This is Davis Finney then on the front. We've got Michael Zanoli now taking his share of the pacemaking. The gap is just 38 seconds. There's a lap and a half still to go here in downtown Philadelphia. Come back and join us for the big finale. Well, the mind is not here because uh, he obviously has a title to defend at the Tour de France. Uh, a big preparation for Greg is to ride in the, the uh, multi-day road races that lead up to it, like the Tour de Switzerland, Tour of Switzerland and 
Tour of Italy, which he's ridden. Uh, he hasn't been riding them very well, and rather than come back over here, take two travel days, uh, go through time zone changes and whatnot before the Tour de France, he felt for this year it was much better uh, to be stay in Europe in preparation for the Tour. Yeah, well, I think Greg will see Greg here again, but the race while we've been talking there has come back together again, so that group has been caught. And uh, I think we can have a little chat with Len Pettijohn once again now. Len is the director of Sport Eat, the manager of Cause Light. You must be very, very happy with the way this race is shaping right now. Well, the race is not over yet. We're, uh, we look like we're in a good spot yet, but a lot can happen in this race, so I don't feel all that comfortable right now. Well, you've got four riders up there, Len. I mean, how many more do you want? <laughs> well, I see Zanoli sitting right in front of me right now, so we don't have that many up there. Whereabouts are you in the race at the moment, Len? I'm sorry, I can't hear you, Phil. Whereabouts are you driving in the race? Are you just behind the leaders? I'm sitting, I'm sitting right behind the main field. Right, OK, so we're watching at the moment the leaders up the climb, and uh, it looks to me as though Alexi Greywall is the rider who's actually appearing to be one of the strong men today, Len. No, we're having a problem, we're having a problem reaching Len Petty John because he is in fact a little way down the field here. But we're watching the leaders now. The penultimate climb of the Manny Young Wall. And these are the four riders. Alexi Greywall, the big Olympic champion, in the center of our picture now. With him, the new professional, David Farmer. And uh, that Southard we've just seen slip through there, Urbanos. And the other man is Norm Alvis. So surprisingly then, and I'm not too sure what's happened here, but once again. Uh, it appears, David, that Davis Finney, who, who just doesn't do a ride in this race, has lost contact with the front group. It looks that way, Phil. Norm Alvis is trying to hold the banner for 7-Eleven. It looks like, though, Alexi Greywall is definitely taking over the aggressor's role on the Manny on the wall for the second to last time. Remember, there's only two, two, two more times up the wall. Uh, this lap and next lap, there's the field coming through at the wall so they can't be that far behind they're down at the bottom while uh, Alexi and company are up near the top so uh, we'll see what happens over the other side of the wall because there is that 50 mile an hour descent and as we heard earlier from some of the riders that's a great place to catch up and in fact the Len Petty John was right when he was saying Zanoli was just in front of him because Zanoli has been dispatched from that lead group right to the back of the main pack we're back with the leaders now and they're climbing very strongly indeed We've got Greywall here now, trying to put in a killer blow on the climb. And the rider who's mastering him really well is James Urbonus. And I think this rider, Dave, could really throw in a few surprises in this race today because he's a very impressive bike rider. Now, let's have a look down the field. We've got John Tomac here from 7-Eleven trying to do something. Gaggioli has gone back into the next group, so he's lost contact with the leaders as well. That's him there in second place. And it looks as though we have Lange Jalabert from the Toshiba team. It's the first time we've seen one of the Europeans who's flew in for this race at the head of the action. And Jalabert, by the way, is a rider who packs a great sprint finish. So if he gets up to the leaders, there could be some action from him. A lot of excitement going on in this ninth lap up the Maniunk wall. The big question is, with that long run in down Kelly Drive towards the city, long flat section, can the time trial specialist and will the 7-Eleven team who's got some good time trial talent try to get more men up there to join Norm Alvis and will Coors Light try and shut down the chase from the field to protect the lead and interest of Alexi Graywall and David Farmer. Clearly Coors Light has the advantage at this point. Alexi and uh, David Farmer, both two riders capable of winning this race. They've got Urbanus outnumbered. Uh, if they can keep the pressure on, that's going to be a tough little group to catch. David Farmer, he's a most mature man, and he's only a youngster, Farmer, who's turned professional this year. And what a fairy tale it would be if he wins here in Philadelphia, because, of course, he's born and bred here. He lives down in Colorado, where he trains at the moment in Boulder, uh, but he very much comes from Philadelphia, and his mother and father are here. His father, in fact, an attorney. And uh, an interesting tale, this one, because his father went to watch him race on Thursday over at Freehold, and the farmer came up with the goods and won it. And the dad has come down again to watch the race today. And here we have David Farmer in what might yet be David Chorner. The final selection here as we watch the leaders coming through. Well, they're coming down the Maniunk wall now. They still have a commanding lead. It looks like they're working hard together. Smart move, of course, light with both Alexi 
and David Farmer up there, two riders who are definitely on form. And uh, I think, look at the gap now between them and the Chasers. They've got clearly, clearly a minute lead, it looks to me, uh, just from judging that distance. The, the pack is still up on the uh, upper slopes of the Maniunk Wall uh, fall, coming down Maniunk Avenue. But it looks like 7-Eleven realizes they're going to have to make some energy here to try and catch them. There's still a long way to go, so you stay tuned. The arrow. Listen up, gentlemen. Our investigating team just discovered why everyone is going to the dark horse. Now, watch carefully. Take the happy hour, for example. Monday through Friday, cocktails for a buck twenty-nine, taco bar, five-foot subs, nachos. Well, here you see a sixty-ounce pitcher of beer for only two ninety-nine. Oh, and their famous burger madness will drive me mad. Just two ninety-nine, but that's not all. There's a private room for parties, great lunches and dinners, and lots of happy people. Nobody get up. Change real. We're back here with the three leaders. It's not too far away now from our first time onto the parkway. And then we do three complete circuits uh, of the parkway once the riders go underneath the finishing banner. And each circuit is one and a half miles. And if you look in the far distance of our picture, you can see that this race really could come together. This day has got to be one of the best finishes we've ever seen in this event. It's a cliffhanger, Phil. It's a real cliffhanger. And uh, they only have a, a very slim lead. They've still got to go over Lemon Hill. Then they come onto the parkway, but they have, once they get on the parkway, three finishing loops of 1.5 miles each. That's a long time to be able to stay out there on the flat working hard in front of a chasing group. So I think uh, it's going to be real, real tight. Dave, how much time can you make up on the three loops? Uh, as Jim Ockowitz said, uh, if you've got the legs, you can make it up in no time. It's a big question now of how strong are the three guys in the front, how much pressure can they keep on versus how much pressure is going to come from behind. Well, 11 seconds is the official time gap, and I would say it's even closer than that. Now, there's confirmation. 11 seconds, and so the little climb of Lemon Hill that uh, pops up just before the finish is now becoming the main talking point of this championship because it's not a significant climb but as the riders said in the press conference only yesterday morning that it could be a springboard for somebody to go and andy bishop is going andy bishop is launching an attack and he's going to try and get across there before things change at the front and this is a very very good move here because if bishop can get across at this stage of the race He'll try and move immediately from the front three into a lone lead. A good attack by Andy Bishop. And Philly has opened up a slight gap. The question is, is he going to get a reaction from the field? Certainly his 7-Eleven teammates aren't going to be the first ones to take up the chase. They'll be watching for uh, the opposing teams and trying to stick on them. But Andy Bishop made a strong move. He is joined now by two other riders, and there's the field. It doesn't look like it's worked. No, it has not worked. The field are coming back again. And as they come round this short climb, they're going to have to put the pressure on a little bit more. Let's have a look here. These are the three leaders. Three and leaders now up at yep. the top of Lemon Hill, and that's uh, uh, Canzoneri in there, also Urbanus, and of course Alexi Graywall, that's Canzoneri. This Italian is riding very, very well, Phil. We didn't see anything of the Italian team early in the race, but at the right time, Canzoneri was there. And this is the head of the field, and there was nothing in that. Uh, maybe eight or nine seconds, Dave. Certainly no more than that, the gap now. And Lem Pettijon may have read this correctly again, which he would be unhappy about, but it could well be true in what he said, which is that this race will now come together as we go down towards uh, downtown Philadelphia for the final time. Let's have a look at the gap, Dave, as we go around this corner here. And there's the leader, and I made that just over seven seconds. Yeah, that's not a very big lead at all. Now, you know, the other thing to think about is when they get on the parkway, the guys who are in the lead, they start thinking about getting ready for the sprint before the guys who are chasing. And uh, that sometimes slows them down. They want to conserve a little bit for that final burst of the line. Uh, if they should do that just in the slightest, it's going to make it even easier for those chasers to catch it. But on the other side, if the chasers are a little bit hesitant about getting up there, sometimes a seven-second gap can remain for quite a while. The Hare and the Hound and Alexi Greywall is actually putting in a great turn at the front because the gap has opened up ever so slightly. They're saying it's now 14 seconds, but a little way to our right, the whole field are coming down on these three riders, and James Bonas here is now trying to keep these three riders 
and just ahead you probably can hear the sirens there well that's the police who've done a marvelous job today to for the safety of the riders and of the public around the course and they are bringing the riders down now towards ben franklin parkway for the final time but of course once on the parkway they face three full circuits of one and a half miles a grandstand finish and despite the fact this race this has gone on for almost six hours. We are going to see all of the action right here on the parkway unravel in front of the whole crowd here because the leaders are going to come on and they're going to come on only just ahead of the whole field. Here they come then. And this, Dave, to me, is like a feeling of the riders swinging onto Champs-Élysées in the Tour de France and a big pack just behind them. It looks like it and it feels like it. There's such a crowd down here in Philadelphia on the Benjamin Franklin Parkway today. It sends chills up your spine. There's Alexi Graywall leading through ready to start the first of three closing loops but the field is not far behind fluctuating between 10 and 15 seconds all the way the big question is is anybody going to be able to bridge that gap it looks like andy bishop is making a big move again to try and narrow it if he can with only three closing laps to go it looks to me uh, like it's going to be a very very tight race here unfolding in front of us on the parkway the exciting conclusion of the 1990 Course Stage Championship, when we come back. Look at the attacking that's going on there. Everyone watching carefully. Someone at any moment is likely to take another flyer. They're watching each other. It's now a very tactical part of the race. It's really going to be who gets the element of surprise as they close in on that last loop. Well, I make it 11 riders have now contacted with this front group and we haven't got all of the names by any manner or means because they've just come on at the back. And many of them, Phil, are riders we haven't seen all day long. Most no. of these guys have not been in the lead positions at all. They've been biding their time. The Spago team, in my estimation, has played a very, very smart race. They've sat back in the back. They've let the 7-Eleven and, and Coors Light teams do most of the action and most of the attacking and counter-attacking. And now, when we come down to the closing laps, they're ready to make their moves. And this again is Gary Mulder, who's trying to loosen up this field but we've also got the Toshiba boys are here now Lange Jalaba is the rider who's come up behind Gary Mulder so the Frenchman who has a terrific sprint finish is now in this lead group and could become the first French winner in just one lap's time they'll get the bell this time when they come through the finishing line and it looks like we're ahead of record time I think this is going to be a record uh, uh, time for the winner now look at they're all looking at each other getting ready now there's one going to be one small loop to go it's going to be desperately close, Dave. Six hours and four minutes is the record time. We're just a shade under six hours right now. We are about one and a half miles from the finish. It looks good. This has been a great race for many, many aspects, but it could still have a surprise winner because those who have gambled on the leaders being caught could have made the right decision today. And Long Jalabert of the Toshiba team is up in this front group now, a man who packs a real sprint finish. One short loop to go, only one short loop to go. The Just Italian team is up there. The Spago team is up there in great force. 7-Eleven and Coors Light are hurting for sure at this point in the bike race. Well, the counter attacks are coming all the time and I can tell you that Gaggioli has missed this split this time. He's behind the group and it looks like it's not gonna be for him. This is Andy Bishop again, uh, trying to break clear with Alexi Graywall countering him. It's Andy Bishop and Alexi Graywall 1-2 at this point. But remember, there are many members of other teams that are still within striking distance. We've got a three-man break now, just a slight edge off the front, hardly anything that we would consider uh, earth-shattering at this point. But Bishop is riding very strongly, Graywall right on his wheel. I think we've got Gary Mulder who's come up there in the third place. So we've got three riders here now going clear. And they may have the gap that matters right now. And Alexi Graywall, well, he's got to have been one of the men of the race today. He's featured in so many of the moves. He's still fighting the strength. Graywall third last year. In contention now for first spot. Also number 46 is in there. Yeah, well, that'll be Oliver Starr now, who has actually come up to the lead group, Dave. So Oliver Starr's got up here now. Andy Bishop is in the lead. Oliver Starr in second place. Bishop looks over his shoulder, and what he sees is the field that caught him, or what's left of this field, completely decimated here on the Ben Franklin Parkway. Look at the tactics. Look at the riders moving from one side of the road to the other one. No one wants to be in that lead-out position when the front rider 
the front rider, remember, has to break the wind. And when you're getting ready for a sprint, you don't want to be the one to lead it out. You want to be in about third or fourth position where you can take advantage of the slipstream for the early part of the sprint, save enough energy to be able to pull out alongside and then kick by for the finish. Sometimes at that moment when all the riders are pausing and waiting for someone else to take the lead, it's possible for a lone rider to spring away and hold the gap to the finish. It's been done before. World Championships have been won like this, but again, an attack on the other side of the road when the Sparga Rise has gone once more, and I think this time it might well be Gary Mulder who's gone off, and he's gone off with terrific speed, but Grey Wall's got his wheel too, and uh, Andy Bishop's in third place. Well, Gary Mulder, he made a good move there. He saw his teammate Oliver Starr was on the front of the group, so he took his chance on the inside while they watched Starr, but you've got to hand it to Alexi Greywall. He read that one right, and Greywall now has got to uh, try and build himself up for what will be, I would say, a sprint finish now. Once Bill, more up the home straight there. Bill, they're less than a quarter mile from the finish, and uh, there's Alexi Greywall starting the lead out. They've also got the Belgian boys here now, and I think this is Marnik Flamira who's come up into second place. The team and sprinter for Belgium, we haven't seen him all day either. And on the inside is Andy Bishop as Greywall again tries to shake him off his wheel. They won't, uh, he won't dislodge him now. There is the Toshiba right, that's Laurent Jalabert. Jalabert's gone for home first. Laurent Jalabert of France, the great sprinter who finished second in the points competition in the Tour of Spain. And on the far side is one of the Belgian, and right on the line, I'm going to have to take that one to the photo finish, but to me, it looked as though the rider who took that, it was between two people, either Laurent Jalabert of France, or it's gone possibly to Belgium, but we'll have to wait for confirmation of that, but what a finish that turned out to be. And we've got uh, the Gish riders congratulating each other here, so it could well be the sprinter from Gish. We'll have a look at this, Dave, in the sprint finish, because I think it was the Italian rider on the far side who has managed to win this. And what a close finish. Look at as they come to the line. They threw their bikes across the line. And it looked like the rider on the inside, which is one of the Gispinotto riders, edged out uh, for first spot. Well, let's have another look at this, Dave, because the rider, I think the rider sprinting on the right is Paolo Cimini. And I would say Paolo Cimini has got it. And what, what a finish, because that was Jalaba who came up on his inside here. What a great international finish. Now, that's 1-2 by foreign riders. It's unofficial, of course. We'll wait for the official results. But 1-2 uh, by, by international riders. That's the first time an American has been shut out of either one of the first two positions anyway. And uh, actually, a third was the best, or the only time that an American uh, didn't finish first or second was a couple of years ago when Ron Keeple was third. There's Alexi Graywall, obviously a little bit disappointed that he came so close, but didn't get the victory. Well, he rode well. Let's have a look at that finish again, because it was rather special. We've not been treated to one of these before here in Philadelphia in the four states. Laurent Jalabert was the Frenchman who seemed to have it, and then came the run on the far right there by the Italian Paolo Cimini, and he's taken it by just over the width of his tire. The 26-year-old from Rome, is now the winner of the core stage.